So we're sitting here uh, with Brian Maguire and his DP, Robert Murphy. Um, we're discussing a whole host of films, but uh, Robert, why don't you start by um, telling people and reminding people of some of the, the great projects that you've worked on leading up to the, the films that are playing Rain Dance this weekend? Wow. Well, Cliff Notes version, we knew each other in Austin, Texas, and we became friends. We were both interested in film. He more as an actor at the time, me more as a director. Um, but we also worked on a lot of music together creatively. We were just kind of uh, creative soulmates, I would say, because we really complemented each other's creativity. He's very punk rock and anti-authoritarianism and fuck off. And I have a little bit of that in me as well, but I'm a little bit more conservative. I'm a little bit more polished maybe with my approach, but I have that quality too. And Brian has my qualities as well, but there's a compliment of things that we we just work well together creatively because we bring slightly different things to the table but we also like each other what each what we bring so we've worked on some shorts some music videos some music uh, other features in the past in texas and then but carlos spills the beans was the first film which it was a true creative collaboration between us for a feature film all the way through from beginning to the end so with Brian as director and me as DP. So it was a real honor for me to work with Brian on a film that was his baby. It's also Joey Capone's mm -hmm. baby as well because the script they'd written. So it was a project where we could uh, work from the casting all the way to editing all the way through to the end. So our, the fact that we had known each other for 15 years and worked on other projects was re really helped us because we knew each other really well. But this was the first time we collaborated on a feature film in this capacity. So it was a little new, but there was a comfort level there, too, because we'd known each other and worked with each other for so long. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we had uh, Hugh shot In Search of the Midnight Kiss uh, with Alex Holder. You, you've shot, what, all of his films? Or a couple of them now? Is it, you two and a half. Two and a half. <laughs> yeah, you shot part of Wrong Numbers as well, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, but. I feel like we worked on other films too, back in oh the, the paper film. chase and yeah. all night boogie. We've done yeah. a lot of different ones? projects. Yeah, he fired me from his feature film back in the back in the nineties. Uh, yeah, we all the Texas boys kind of fired yeah. each other. But I rehired him in yeah. another role in the same film. Yep. So this is kind of our relationship. Yeah. But this was really special because it was he Brian has really. Um, I mean, I've seen Brian from when he was eighteen years old. He was first starting acting to now where he's like an experienced director, he, he's active, he's written, he's directed, he's done all these great projects. So it was really cool to jump on a film with him in a prime creative period in his life where he's just like churning out these movies. And what I wanted to do was just bring something a little different to his films. Bring, uh, since most of his films were low budget, I was like, well, why not we try to make one that's very polished very uh, also slightly stylized, kind of Coen Brothersy, Wes Anderson visually, and, and let these let these actors who've been in all these kind of indie films be in a film that just looks like a, a Hollywood movie with a lot of style. Well, I always as an wanted experiment, to sort. That's what I was where yeah, I was coming from. I always but, wanted to to shoot with wide angle lenses, and uh, yeah. Jared Barava, who shot Don Holiday and uh, and Black Bell. He hated wide-angle lenses, so I was like, "Fuck, okay, well, we'll figure out something else." With Robert, he's like, "Let's do it," you know. And, and, the, and then we—I had not done that though, so it was kind of new. But I wanted to do yeah. it too. And it was like something where we were like, "Let's try to shoot everything on <laughs> wide-angle lenses," and so we'll move the camera versus like you know switching the lens or whatever. Which we switched the lens here and there on, on stuff, but we, yeah, we, we stayed wide for most of it though. It was kind of like the, the director of Amelie. I, I would do horrible justice if I pronounce his name, but that the Jean Pierre Genet. Yes, Janae, because uh, he shoots everything with 25, 27, 30 lenses, and that's pretty much, we didn't go quite as cartoonish on Carlos, but we went in that range. Yeah. I mean, the lens is, uh, is what gives the film, it's, it's what, what I said in the review, it's kind of grotesque quality, that's as well cool. as the fact that the, the <laughs> characters are, are pretty repulsive, but... You know, the cool thing about those lenses, too, the lens package that we used it all came from the 70s, too. So there were these little things that were really hard to get onto the, onto the red camera and stuff. But it was like, once we were doing the test and we put them on, it was like, oh, yeah, that just looks like <laughs> dirty, you know? Like, let's go with that versus the prime. White exploitation know? again. Yeah, more white exploitation. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is about the Carlos and the characters, I'll kind of, 
I wouldn't say they're repulsive because what I like about Carlos's characters from the original script is that, yes, on the surface they are Joey's character, the the lead. He is an asshole, and his family is a bunch of assholes. But the things he goes through as a character are things that everyone goes through. You lose your girlfriend. You got sexual problems. Like I that's don't have that. well. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Everybody has sexual problems one way or the other. But the, the jealousy of someone else dating your ex—that everyone can relate to that, and everyone can relate to how angry he gets. And when you're working like a job at a, a shitty job at a restaurant, like you're just getting a, wanting to get a little bit of respect and never getting it. It's everyone's been through that too. So it's like, even though the character is kind of a dick, like I think you. I really relate to him, and I'm rooting for him the whole time. He, as big of an asshole as he is, like I'm rooting for him. I don't know why, but I'm not. I'm not repulsed. Is what I. What I'll, I mean. I'll meet you in the middle <laughs> and, and say that I understand him. I'm certainly not rooting for. Him. I understand him, and I would say he's the uh, probably the littlest dick in a bunch of dicks. <laughs> he's yeah, definitely a bigger yeah. asshole in yeah. the film. Uh-huh. So the the fact that it is all around this central location boils. Uh, when I first saw the film, I was thinking, well, that's part of the reason it looks so good is because it's it's all contained and it's easier to manage. But I'm sure there's there's a lot more to it than that. So, well, it's weird when you're shooting like seventy percent of the movie in one location. It, it, you you got to find ways to keep it interesting. So you know, we're just shooting at the same spot at the bar. It's like how do we shoot this so it doesn't look like the last scene was always kind of the challenge, I'd say, yeah? Yeah, we tried to shoot each scene in a different area of the restaurant to give it different flavor and not repeat that. We had a great gaffer, Pat, who, what's Pat's last name? Burns. I always call him Pat on the set. Look on the credits. Pat is a, he's a Sorry, gaffer in Hollywood for 10 years, so I never even worked with a gaffer before. I'm a super indie DP, so. Having a really great experienced gaffer like that, he brought a little bit of that gloss and that sheen to the lighting. Um, we also tried to keep the lighting kind of dim, kind of like like a real restaurant, and not just overlight everything, which is very common in Hollywood. So um, we shot in every part of that restaurant. We shot in the back alley where there's all that crazy graffiti on the walls. We thought that was beautiful, and we shot there right before the the uh, they took it down. Yeah. So we were very lucky to finish shooting that scene. Um, I don't know, in terms of production value, it, it was very simple. A lot of wide-angle lenses, a um, lot of very polished lighting, um, simple shots, not a whole lot of shots. We storyboarded this whole movie with Star Wars action figures, mm-hmm. right? Remember yeah, that? Yeah, and and, and yeah. little little uh, pieces of change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We just, Brian and I just sat around a table and we just talked about the, every scene yeah, and all the angles, figured out where the camera was going to be and we just had a lot of fun with it. So. By the time we got to set, like Brian knew exactly what the shots were going to be. He was happy with how we were going to cover it. We did not stray from that, but maybe once or twice, very rarely. Yeah, well, I mean, because since we lost the location, everything that I had shot listed for, all the Star Wars <laughs> toys and stuff, all went out the damn window. So I was like, every night, like after we were done shooting, I was going home and like reshot listing for the next day, uh, you know, in the new location. So I don't know. Yeah. It was crazy. But, but we did luck out because the location we used had these amazing chandeliers yeah. that were hanging down. And I thought, since we were gonna shoot with wide lenses, we would see the chandeliers in every shot, literally. And that gave the film kind of a, I don't know, at times it almost looks like something out of Mad Men. At times it looks like, you don't even know what time period this movie is. Yeah, It feels mm-hmm. weird, it doesn't feel like it's it looks like It looks like a spaceship yeah. <laughs> at times, <laughs> yeah, I think. It does. It's gonna be one of those weird movies that has a timeless quality mm-hmm. to it. Um, in terms of how it looks, because I'm always when I see it, I'm like, well, am I watching Mad Men? Or because Mad Men's shot in the same restaurant, yeah. So you don't. Know, it's just it has a unique. Mo- the movie has a unique mood because it's got this crazy '90s rock that Andy Clockwise did, yeah. And again, yeah, it's got this gr- great jazzy score that Eden Emmett mm-hmm. did. So it has a little Twin Peaksy vibe, a little rock and the '90s rock vibe mixed in with this kind of Coen Brothersy shooting style. It's just a weird movie. <laughs> So the fact that you're using these wide lenses and the fact that you're in location, one location and you have to carefully choose your angles, you know, on, on most films when you're uh, housebound, if you, were, you, you know, once you start running out of shots, you're putting the camera up people's noses, canted angles, Dutch angles, whatever, but you've also got to be careful if you're using those wide lenses. You, you, you can't do that either because 
no. everything is going to be that much more exaggerated. Mm -hmm. There's a line you don't want to cross because we wanted a little cartoonish, but we also wanted the actors to look good, and we didn't want to be, you know, we didn't want to do just crazy weird shots for the point of doing it. We wanted to make it a little cartoonish and a little slightly stylized version of a restaurant. We didn't want it to look like a documentary or something real. We wanted it to look slightly slightly cartoony without going over the top. You know, like no crazy dollies into a mouth going, wah! You know, like you can get over the top really easily with some camera work. And we were just like, let's just keep it toned down. Let the actors play. Let these wide shots play. Because Brian referenced some Jarmouche films that were, where there were these beautiful wide shots and the actors would just play out the scenes. And there's a lot of stuff in Carlos where that is the case. You just see these actors play out these long, long takes or, or wider shots. A little bit of cutting, but not too... One of, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, the scene between uh, Brett and Joey when they're in the back alley. And uh, the, it's just the, the, it's all choreographed in the way where they stand and then they position each other. And it was the first time like that I really kind of set it up to where like, people had this dance to do. Oh, we've done a little bit of that on Black Belt. But, uh, and so then the camera, I, I like moving the actors for the camera versus moving the camera for the actors. In that film, that was kind of the goal. I, I felt like you could get more miles out of it too. You could shoot, see, capture scenes faster, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know we were didn't have much time, so it was like always trying to find a creative, technical way to you know move forward in the, in the, on the set. Yeah, but we kept it kept it still kept it relatively simple in yeah. terms of blocking. A little yeah. bit of blocking here and there. It's just simple though, yeah. Because we didn't have time to do a ton of covers and a ton of angles, honestly. Yeah. Well, you were saying about your music video past and we've talked uh, in the previous interview about it, it it's kind of polished features and uh, certainly in the dream sequences it has got a kind of a bit of a beastie boys you know the way the the characters kind of slide into frame or the yeah. camera <laughs> kind of slides uh, past them um, but it's it's are you kind of conscious of of, of that stuff of uh, of going into um MTV Overdrive again. That, that's got to be a balancing act, also. Yes, for the dream sequences, we felt like we could get a little weirder and crazier and more stylized. I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, but the dream sequences were. I mean, he had written out kind of what happens, but we didn't quite know yeah, how we were going to shoot it. Happen. Like, yeah. so we got to the set and we saw Joey in the sombrero naked. And we're like, how are we going to do this? And we were, I guess we kind of like, let's just slide into a crazy frame of him crying. Yeah, I think we, <laughs> I think I kind of invented the whole idea, like about, or, or how we were going to cover the scene about 15 minutes beforehand. And uh, uh, originally it was like, oh, we'll jump over here, we'll here. And then I'm like, wow, we, we, when we started, I'm like, let's just keep the camera on this side and, and then people will change. And like, if they're supposed to be back, you know, if we're looking at them here, then we'll just reverse the people here. It's a dream. It doesn't matter. You know, like, we'll just kind of throw it together. But, yeah. I mean, a lot of people who are, are watching this, um, you know, through and because of Rain Dance, they're going to be no budget or low budget uh, f filmmakers, really. And uh, you were saying about how it was the first time that you'd have gaff you'd have gaffers and a crew and a team. So just talk about making that jump and were you able to hit the ground running, or was there a a kind of time of, of finding that synergy. It was also the first time that you shot with the red too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I hadn't shot with the red. Yeah. I hadn't shot with a with a, an actual you know, reasonable sized crew before. So yeah, it is an adjustment. It's more of a social adjustment than an artistic adjustment because it's you have all these people you have to talk to. And um, we had an AD. You know, we never had a first AD before. You know, so that yeah. was like. Which sucks, because all of a sudden you have somebody telling you, you only have 15 more minutes to shoot the scene. Now get done. And we're like, well, wait, well, we didn't Coming from where to... we're coming from, we already know we, know. we have 15 <laughs> minutes left. You know, yeah, you we don't, don't, need to be, don't need to be told. Yeah. But, but it, the thing is, when you're working with talented crew members, in which the crew was very talented on Carlos, the gaffer Pat, whose last name is unknown right now, yes. extremely talented, very quick to light, and I would just tell him, I mean, Brian had an idea that we'd already talked about, so I would just kind of relate that to the gaffer. He'd light it, I'd pro we'd look at the monitor, and we'd probably, we'd say something like, well, let's make it darker, 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 darker. That's what I would just keep telling him. Uh, but generally, like, it was simple. He, Pat, the gaffer, and his team picked up on what we wanted to do pretty quickly. Yeah. And then after a couple of days, it took us like two days to get a rhythm, and then we were 
in a great and Pat's a great guy, very easy to work with, so it became you know, it became very much a good crew after about two days. But it took two days to get everything to get comfortable because again, these are people we've just met once before. Yeah. So it's a little weird when you're on a bigger set with a lot more people because it's easy to get bogged down and all that, but it's really about communication. You just gotta communicate to, to the gaffers and the grips what they need and then then it can it can work. But if you don't communicate well, if you're a dick or if you're just you know you're not willing to explain things and things can really suffer. So I just wanted everyone to be comfortable and clear on what we wanted so that we could make the film that's in his head. That's the goal. He's got this crazy film in his head. And you know, my goal as DP, I, I feel like, is to make whatever's in there on the screen when as much as we can. Well, the greatest thing about, <laughs> about Robert Murphy, and this is not even an exaggeration, like he cares more than anybody else working on the film even you usually and, he, and he's the guy that literally will be the last one to leave and be the first one there and he's coming with so much creativity and so my, so many ideas and uh, and he's also just one of the nicest guys in the world so to have him on your set is like for me it's like very crucial and, and key you know he's, he's an, an incredible talent well I'm going to put you on the spot then and, 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 and quiz you a specific sure. example of Rob's creativity where there was a block uh, maybe with terms of, in terms of how you wanted to present something and you just didn't know. Yeah. And there was a, there was a kind of hallelujah moment maybe where, where Rob, uh, Rob came up with something or came to the rescue or whatever. Well, I mean, I, I think it's if I can't, well, I'll tell the I don't story. Know if there's situations like well, that exactly, yeah. but it's like well, as soon as I say like this is kind of my <laughs> idea, I want to shoot with wide angle lenses, then he gives you ten more I options or ways to go about doing that. You know, he's it's always like. A, a presentation of, of 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 how to do that right, or, or uh, your options. Or I'll mention to do ten that. movies. Uh, do, do you yeah. want your movie to look like you know Raising Arizona, or do you want it to look like a Wes Anderson film, Royal Tenenbaums? Like what kind of look, what kind yeah. of lighting? You know, I'll just kind of like work through that. He can have a choice. Oh, I kind of want to go more with this feel or this feel, or maybe something new. You know, it's yeah. I mean, it was pretty planned out. There wasn't like, too by the yeah. Uh, there wasn't too many moments where I was like, I don't know what to do here. You know, like uh, as far as how to cover the scene or something. That happened to me on on holiday, with the, which was my first film, and there was just so many people, and there would be like fifteen people in a room, and I would have this idea shot listed out, and I'd get there, and I'd be like, I don't know how to do this. So Jared Bravo like would like. And I hadn't really been in that chair, so I was like, what the hell do we do here? And he would just kind of like, he ran a little bit, and then I started to figure it out. But like with Carlos, it was it was pretty planned out. I mean, we didn't do but one one or two takes. We did two takes on average for every setup, and, and you know, that's all the time we had for. So it was like, it was compacted and, and ready to move. But I mean, I, I've got a new uh, script that I'm writing right now, and I want Robert to shoot it. And like, oh, I mentioned it to him, and he gave me like, probably 20 different examples or ideas and it which made my brain go crazy or helped me to move forward in the writing process too so yeah it's like brian knows he wants to go from a to b to c to d and it's like our collaboration is more like okay here's how ways we could maybe get there so that's how i, I would probably describe yeah. it yeah and what about um coloring in post talk a little bit about that well, we had a, uh, an amazing colorist, Joel Ides, who worked on both Carlos and Nine Full Moons. So we've worked on Carlos first. And Privateer as well. And Privateer, I didn't yeah. even know that he did that one. Yeah. It's great. Um, but he uh, is a very experienced colorist. He worked at HBO previously doing uh, coloring a lot of stuff for them. Not like Game of Thrones stuff, but he colored a lot of uh, promos and shorts and other things like that. I mean, very talented, up and coming colorist. Now he's got a lot more credits. But we basically, um, <clears throat> the, the coloring was a collaboration between Brian, me, and Joel of us sitting in a room together and just experimenting with looks. And we wanted a little bit, for Carlos, I think, we wanted that, that Cohen Brothers-y wide angle thing, but we also wanted it to look a little dirty and gritty too. So we went with kind of a slightly 70s thing, you know. Um, so how much not, of that 70s thing is in camera? And how much of it about is? About half. Okay. I mean, not, with, the, 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 with the coloring, it's not like we changed a ton. I feel like the coloring just sort of enhanced yeah. what we shot. More is the icing on the cake rather than the baking of the cake. We baked the cake. Joel added a little, some icing with the color. It wasn't a, a dramatic change from what we shot. But we shot, we were happy with. Like, we got what we wanted. We just wanted to enhance it a little bit. I yeah, I kind of pushed it in the directions that it, that it could go. But, 
Um, Dream sequence was Technicolor look yeah. was thrown on, so that was definitely your MTV reference. The coloring really helped in the dream sequences of Carlos, I would say. Yeah. That was a more extreme change. Yeah. You know, but the rest of the movie we probably made a little darker, made a little muddier with, with the coloring. Um, and Joel is fantastic because he is all the stuff he does is very subtle. He doesn't try to do these big crazy things. He just tries to keep it simple. And, and and be true to how we lit it, but I, so I would say I would say more it's like 80, 90 percent is what we shot, and 10 percent was coloring. Yeah. But I don't want to say that in terms of credit. Like Joel's an amazing colorist, and I would recommend him to any film because he really respects um, the work of the DP, and he doesn't want to just change it or screw it up. Like he knows how to keep it to yeah. be true to what we shot, and all, but also add his own creativity to it. I think Carlos was the first film color wise that I didn't say to the colorist, I want it to look like Buffalo 66. But I, I say that about the, every other film that I've made. I'm like, kind of like Buffalo 66, you know, like, it's my favorite colored film. But yeah. 